Coming to you from Brick House in downtown Brooklyn, this is 112BK. On the show today, the Department of Transportation will tell us about their Vision Zero progress in the aftermath of a tragic accident, a report from those who marched in D.C. against gun violence, and a superhero-inspired rabbi here to talk Passover. Hi, I'm Ashley Ford. Thanks for joining us. The other day, we mentioned a community board meeting giving Brooklyn residents an opportunity to express their opinions about a proposed development at 80 Flatbush, right in the intersection of Borum Hill, Fort Greene, and downtown. The project would pretty much encompass a city block, include two schools, and be able to, be, to boast Brooklyn's tallest building. The event was Wednesday night, and it was pretty well attended, actually over-attended. Our producer, Ariana Rosas, had trouble getting in, and she saw about 100 unhappy people who were turned away. It's notable that more than 200 people showed up for a community board meeting, usually pretty dull fare. But it's not surprising. This project perfectly encapsulates the tensions upsetting the borough right now. Many feel that Brooklyn is growing too far, too fast, that it doesn't resemble the Brooklyn they used to know. These folks believe gentrification is rampant, and in return for a few units of quote-unquote affordable housing, developers are able to pretty much run amok. And the city, for its part, is willing to give steep tax breaks to these developers. According to Ariana, these were some of the concerns people expressed. Displacement, congestion, inadequate open space, too much waste, vermin, frogs, locusts, slaying of the firstborn. Okay, sorry. That's a little nod to Passover. The development, if approved, will have two towers, one 38 stories tall and one with 74. The developers are asking for rezoning that would allow the floor area ratio to nearly triple, meaning a lot of floors on a little bit of acreage. If you haven't been to this part of town recently, you'd be shocked. It's unrecognizable from a couple of years ago. But is that entirely a bad thing? If you'd still like to weigh in, Community Board 2 will be accepting written testimony until Friday the 30th. On the show today, an assistant commissioner from the Department of Transportation will talk about the latest with Vision Zero in the aftermath of a high-profile and deadly traffic accident in Park Slope. Some of the participants in the March for Our Lives will be here, and a local rabbi to talk about Passover just ahead of the first Seder. Stay tuned. <laughs> Earlier this month, a traffic accident in Park Slope that left two young children dead focused attention again on the city's traffic woes. And though Mayor de Blasio's Vision Zero, an effort to bring traffic fatalities down to zero, has been statistically effective, the deaths are still intolerable for families and communities, especially when they feel they can be avoided. Now, there were a number of other aspects of that recent fatality concerning the driver and why a license doesn't get suspended when, on multiple occasions, cameras have ticketed a car for speeding in school zones or when the driver has a history of hit and runs. But those are questions for the NYPD and the DMV, not our next guest. We have with us the Department of Transportation's Assistant Commissioner for Education and Outreach to talk about Vision Zero and what more can be done to keep New Yorkers safe. Welcome to 112 VK, Kim Wiley Schwartz. Thank you. Thank you for having me. First of all, can you just tell me a little bit about Vision Zero? What is it? Sure. I'd be happy to. Yes. So we started uh, over four years ago. It's one of the first things that Mayor de Blasio did when he came in. Mm -hmm. And the idea is, uh, rather than each individual agency working as in a silo or sort of in parallel tracks, we work all together, trying right. to bring together initiatives. and. Uh, I think, for the most part, we're able to amplify each other's work and also keep each other on track. So it's a really different approach. Right. Um, I've been at this job for eight years, and the last four years have been by far my most robust and successful in terms of working with NYPD, the Taxi right. and Limousine Commission, and many, many other agencies who sit on the Vision Zero Task Force. Was Vision Zero prompted by anything? Was it born from any oh, one Definitely. I mean, first of all, it has a long history in Sweden and a couple of other places. Mm -hmm. But th there's no question that uh, transportation alternatives, a along with the Families for Safe Streets, mm -hmm. who had had a spate of horrific losses of life, especially to children in, in the fall of 2013, right. got together and made it part of de Blasio's platform before he was even elected, wow. and then held him to that. I mean, it was January 15th. Uh, 15 days into his leadership where he announced Vision Zero and put us all to task. Yes. 
Speaking of putting people to task, what made this your thing? Why are you in this role? Currently? Yeah, thank you for asking me. Very few people do. Yeah. <laughs> um, I actually was um, a teacher. I worked with youth in after school. I'm an arts educator. Mm -hmm. And 10 years ago, really almost to the day, a child was killed uh, in my neighborhood. I live at 3rd uh, near Butler. And wow. a, a four-year-old named James Rice was walking home with his babysitter. And a car came around the corner and killed that child. And that driver did not get anything but a ticket for failure to yield. Oh, and I God. dropped everything and decided that I would make this my life's work. <laughs> mm. That is <laughs> insane. Uh, yeah, it was really that's wild. insane. I can't and imagine. And I can't imagine that loss. Um, but Vision Zero, you know, you guys have officially been around for four years. How do we get from where we are now to zero? Right, so I think that's the rub, right? So mm -hmm. there are pieces of Vision Zero that are coming together and working. I mean, we've been able to do so much engineering mm -hmm. in four years. It's a, it, you know, you have to build on that and, and it's a build process and with five boroughs and so many neighborhoods in order to really look at equity and going right. to where the crashes are, that, that takes a little bit of time. Right. Um, I think this, this latest crash in Park Slope reminds us that there are things that we need to reach beyond yes. our own scope of work. And that's yes. really where Vision Zero needs to go. I mean, legislation is huge. We've been having a terrible time trying to get speed, uh, additional speed cameras. Mm -hmm. And we have to ask Albany for that. And Families for Safe Streets was just up there this week uh, asking again, mm -hmm. you know, to people from Albany, because we know they work, where we put in a speed camera, we have right. a 60% reduction in speeding. Right. And where this crash was at 9th and 5th, if we had had those new rules, we, there are two schools within mm -hmm. The zone we could have a speed camera there. Not that this particular driver was heating right. speed camera. Right. I know that the speed camera is obviously a deterrent. Um, would love to see more of those in these places. What about things like street design? Yeah. What about like are those also factors? Are, are were they factors in the situation? Well, I mean, it's very hard to say if they are factors here. Right. I mean. We, we need to slowly but surely make sure that every street is designed to pull the speed out of it. We know mm -hmm. that speeding is really not just a leading cause, but often the cause that makes the difference between a fatality and an injury. In this case, I don't, because she came to a complete stop, I, I don't right. think that that was the case. But um, you know, we need to continue to do that. So on 4th Avenue, for example, in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. there's many places in Brooklyn where we've seen reducing from three lanes to two, right. making more space for uh, safer turns, banning left-hand turns, which we know mm. are four times more dangerous than right-hand turns. Right. But this is this is sometimes a painful experience in communities, but we mm -hmm. need communities to understand that when we make these decisions, they save lives. Right. And that's really, I think, where we need to be the next four years of Vision Zero, mm -hmm. working with communities and making the decisions that we know will save lives right. over everything. Right. Um, only 9% of hit-and-run drivers who injured someone in New York City were arrested, which is... Uh, I, it, which is mind-boggling when you say you know and that was just true last year mm -hmm. um, and when you've talked about you know your impetus for getting involved being you know a child being involved yeah. in you know a hit-and-run situation what are you guys doing to make pedestrians feel safer because mm -hmm. I have to imagine that in communities who have experienced a lot of this trauma um, or who are you know especially something like what happened in Park Slope. How do you get the trust back from the community that these things are going to be taken care right. of? Right, that's a really good question. Well, I mean, there's so many different ways. I mean, enforcement is a huge piece of this. We need to have, we need to have our precincts focused on this work, but they are. But we need to go about that carefully, because mm -hmm. unless we focus enforcement on our high crash areas, this can be, misguided and go yeah. to the wrong and used in the wrong way. Right. We need to look at the places where the highest crashes are and work our way through right. um, and make robust decisions, even if it means that we move, you know, the curbside in and make room for bikes or we get right. rid of cars in places. And then lastly, 
you know, we've been doing this culture change, this education, mm -hmm. uh, which has many facets. And of course, it is my job to go to more than 600 public schools a year to do pedestrian and car passenger driver education for youth. You know, we do all of those things, but that's just a piece of the puzzle. I think the big thing that we're trying to do that we did with our Your Choices Matter campaign for the last four years, and now mm -hmm. we have a, a campaign called Driving is Easy but Saving, um, Driving is Hard but Saving a Life is Easy, mm -hmm. which is, I don't know if you've seen it, but it has pe people holding s simple street signs, yes. saying like, if I came with a sign, would you yield to me? Would you drive 25? Right. Um, there's a culture change piece, and we mm -hmm. do see a shift in your regular driver. We're right. seeing speeds go down. You know, that outlier driver, mm -hmm. that driver who sit, hits someone and takes off, right. or who drives even though they know they shouldn't be driving, right. you know, no safety education campaign is going to get to them. No, no, no. no. That, that, that's not the target market right there. Right. Those are the people that you have to put away at some point, and, you know, they have to feel right. the consequences of right. that kind. And we have a terrific collision investigation squad, right. and they go to every fatality and serious injury crash. Um, but you know, as you as you see, right. you know, there's people. It, it, it is difficult for them to catch people who drive away. Yeah, absolutely, and understand, especially when you don't have the cameras. Right. Um, what are, like, just in the minute we have left, and I'm, I wish we had more time to keep mm -hmm. talking, but what are some of the goals you guys have for 2018? So, of course, we're going to have another robust uh, season where we're going to do what we call street improvement projects, mm -hmm. um, where we will try to take long corridors. We've had great success on Queens Boulevard. Mm -hmm. uh, um, we, you know, in, well, actually, in Fourth Avenue, we're going to pilot a small uh, part of it that's going to have a separated bike lane now. Right. Um, there's all sorts of places. We have this new campaign that we're particularly proud of. I was actually shooting out on the street today, mm -hmm. um, which will run on television and we'll work with the sports teams like we always do to kind of get to, to, to the people who are most likely to injure with their vehicles. And, uh, you know, I know that Chief Chan at the NYPD is going to be looking at more targeted enforcement. When I say targeted, enforcement right. I mean to where the crashes occur High crash areas. and where we see so often people are not from a neighborhood or coming mm -hmm. in off of highways speeding through our neighborhood right. and we're gonna try to work with people to make sure that they drive like their children live there that's fantastic thank you so much for being here I wish you all the best thank you uh, vision zero let's get there let's get it all right thanks thank you Hundreds of thousands marched for their lives last weekend in the demonstrations demanding legislation on gun control. There was a great turnout in New York, but some Brooklynites made the trip to D.C. to join in the main event. Two of those individuals are with us today. They're with the Crown Heights Mediation Center, and they organized a group of students to go down. They're here to tell us about that experience. We want to welcome Amy Ellen Bogan, the center's director. Happy to have you here, Amy. And Rasan Johnson is Youth Program Specialist. Thanks for coming on 112 VK, Russ. Thank you. Amy, let's start with you. Sorry, I'm going to take a drink of water here. But I want to start with you really quickly. Mm -hmm. Tell us what the Mediation Center is and what SOS means. Sure. Okay. Um, the Crown Heights Community Mediation Center is a 19-year-old project of the Center for Court Innovation. Mm -hmm. We originally started to address the community violence that happened in Crown Heights between the African-American, Caribbean-American, and Hasidic Jewish community. But over the time, we really evolved. Um, we're a storefront, and now we're multiple storefronts, mm -hmm. and we take direction from the community on what the most pressing issues are. And in 2005, um, we decided to take on gun violence. Um, a mother came into our storefront and asked for our help, and we decided that we needed to respond to her plea. There had been a series of incidences that had happened before, but when she came in and directly asked for our help, um, her son, Benny, lied. Um, had been killed around the corner from our office, and so we began to convene parties from the neighborhood who don't normally come together to try to solve this issue of gun violence. Eventually, um, four years later, after learning and convening and talking and trying and exper experimenting, um, we received federal funding to create 
a public health response to gun violence. SOS is a program that um, uses a public health approach. We hire people from the neighborhood who are credible messengers to the people who are most likely to be involved in gun violence incidences, and they help people change the way they think and behave about gun violence. We help people heal from the effects of gun violence, and we have a mobilization arm of young people and clergy and residents of all ages who are working collaboratively to stop the plague of gun violence. I love that. And SOS stands for Save Our Streets, correct? Yes. You guys have been doing so much of this work locally in Crown Heights and also in parts of Bed-Stuy. So what was the call to action that got you guys to specifically go to D.C. for the March for Our Lives? Mm -hmm. So we actually have participated in school walkouts and marches over the years. Mm -hmm. um, our young people did a march, I think, in 2010 about ending wow. gun violence. So these kinds of tactics are things that young people, young people of color in Brooklyn have been doing year after year after year. So this tactic of convening and walking out on school is very familiar with us, um, to us. Mm -hmm. And the, the call when it came um, resonated with everything we were doing and we right. wanted to make sure that the needs of young people of color are represented in any kind of solutions that get presented in, right. on the national agenda. Absolutely. And Rosan, that is where you come in specifically. Talk to me a little bit about your involvement with the Mediation Center and also just what you do in your role there. So, in the Crown Heights Community Mediation Center, I work with the YoSOS program, mm -hmm. which stands for Youth Organizing to Save Our Streets. In that capacity, I'm a youth program specialist. So what does that mean, mm -hmm. right? Um, as a youth program specialist, I work along my supervisor and definitely um, my director, Amy Ellen Bogan, and we do workshops on Mondays and Wednesdays for um, high school students mm -hmm. um, who come there. We teach them about uh, trauma. We teach them about community violence. Um, we also encourage them to become peer educators and the community leaders that they rightfully are. So during these workshops, we definitely go around our speak about our issues of how do we reduce gun violence inside of our communities? How do we create um, safety and make our community safe and healthier for everyone? So right. the young people go through a number of uh, exercises and workshops that deal with conflict de-escalation, mm -hmm. about being able to heal from trauma. We talk about PTSD. We also speak about how do you treat yourself? How do you get self-care? Because it's important to understand that young people go through trauma every day, all people mm -hmm. go through trauma every day, but how do we heal from that? How do we begin to become resilient and recover from those issues that we see every day? Right. So I got involved. I actually love being there. I call it my second home. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I love being there. I love being there, involved and engaged in the youth, but I also enjoy being able to learn from the youth as well. Of course, because there's always so much to learn from them, I find. What was it like getting ready to go to the march? How did you prepare for that in talking with them? Um, so the incident, um, if I can recall correctly, the incident happened on February 14th, mm -hmm. and we actually had a workshop that day. Um, and while we in the workshop, we're not really checking phones or looking at the TV or anything like that. But once we got wind of the incident, um, we began with a discussion about we want to talk about what happened in Parkland. We want to talk about how does that connect with issues that we talk about every day or every week while we're in right. workshop and what you see all the time in your communities. Mm -hmm. So the youth definitely had um, responses. They spoke about personal losses that they had, personal tragedies, but also they spoke about feeling the same way that the people in Parkland would feel mm -hmm. with regards to the incident, very tragic this, incident. I really like this because with that, tells me, and I think what it should tell everybody, and this is one of the ways that we're going to be able to combat this kind of thing, is that kids here could have empathy mm. for kids Absolutely. somewhere so far away. And not just uh, not just the sort of like empathy to like, oh, I've been through the same thing, but also just like, I feel that pain. Mm -hmm. And I know what it's like to lose the people in your community to this kind of violence. And, you know, hopefully, that's something that they hold with themselves well into adulthood. I think that's how yeah. we turn this thing on its head. That's how we change it. Um, we're running out of time, and I really hate that that's the case, but really quickly, can you tell me what are some of the big things you guys have coming up, Amy? Oh, 
That's Rasan. Oh, Rasan. <laughs> Rasan's the date guy. <laughs> yeah. So we have events coming up. We have an event that's coming up April 18th, which is going to be right here in Brick um, from mm -hmm. 6 o'clock. It's called Media Arts Campaign. So what happens is we have young people that's involved with theater. They're going to put on a show. Um, also have a group of young people that's doing an uh, original song that speaks about um, anti-violence, anti-gun violence, and how to reduce gun violence. So that's going to air on the 18th, February, um, May, um, April 18th here, and then we have another one that's going to be on April 23rd at Repair the World, that's at 808 Nostrand Avenue. We also have in May and June graduations coming up for uh, young people that are part of the program. April 20th, we have what is called Paving the Way Conference um, for our program, Make It Happen, which deal with young men of color who have been victims of uh, violence and how to heal from trauma. So that's an all-day conference, and that's going to be at Mega Evans. Um, what else do we have? I know that those are more of the major you know, events that we have. Those are the major events that we have. Oh, also we have our Austin End Violence that's mm. coming up May 24th, which um, typically is held on St. John's mm -hmm. um, inside of a gallery. So what we do every year is we go to communities, organizations, and to schools, and we ask the people and the young people involved to create art that will speak against end of violence. And we have done a number of workshops inside of schools. And then it's a gallery show. We invite the community members to come out. Uh, whoever um, presents the uh, the piece to be judged, and they can be you know, win a, um, a cash prize for the contest. Right. That sounds amazing, Amy. Really quickly, um, what was it like being in DC? Yeah, it was. Um, I, I think this will answer your question. One of the young people said to me, "It was the first time I didn't feel alone in my grief." And he was somebody who lost his brother, and he'd never been to D.C. before, and he had felt very, very isolated in having lost his brother to gun violence. Right. And I think a lot of people felt surprised by how moved they were by the the pain of mm -hmm. everyone around them, that collective right. grieving oh, process. All camaraderie and that pain, and under, knowing that the people who stand next to you and march with you really understand how you feel and what you've been through. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you both so much for being here. Please come back. Let's keep having this conversation, and it's important. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. The Roar Chabad Jewish Center. It's not your normal synagogue experience. It's essentially in a storefront on Myrtle Avenue. It has a small congregation, and the head rabbi is a devout superhero fan. In fact, he's written a book on superheroes in Judaism. It's not cavalier and clay, but kind of like it. He's Simko Weinstein, resident rabbi for Pratt University, where he tries to infuse his sermons with art. We invited him on today, the day before Passover's first Seder, to tell us about the holiday and what inspires him to share his belief system with others. Welcome to 112BK. Thank you for having me, Ashley. Tell me a little bit about what Passover means for the Jewish community. I mean, Passover is really the birth of a nation. I mean, the Jewish people uh, began uh, in slavery and servitude, and it's, uh, it's a very powerful day because it's the day that uh, a small uh, tribe of servants stood up and said, we're going to dare to dream. We're going to be the daughters of destiny. We're going to be the architects of the future, and we're going to forge a future in the promised land over a vast desert. Yes. Oh. Whew. How did you end up as a rabbi at Pratt? So I like to tell people I did not grow up uh, Hasidic, observant, orthodox. I grew up normal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm from Manchester, England, and uh, growing up in Manchester, I, I really always had a love of Judaism, and mm -hmm. uh, I used to work in the film industry, and I got a little cynical. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't be offended, Ashley. <laughs> and, uh, okay. you know, that really brought me to, to Israel, and it was a revolution, not a revolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, today I'm back in art school. I was an art school student, now I'm an art school rabbi. So it's really like ministering to myself uh, 20 years ago. And and uh, it's, it's really, it's a pleasure and a profound privilege. Wow. So what are some of the unique programs you're offering to students at the center who sort of want to play with that intersection of art and religion? Well, for example, you know, Passover, it's about peeps, uh, plagues and uh, and props. Uh, you know, we try and, uh, you know, I don't want to put uh, my uh, congregants in a sermon-induced coma. Mm -hmm. I want the service to come alive. It should be interactive. It should be fun. It should be friendly. And uh, it should be meaningful. 
how, how do you do that with art though? Like what, like what, how do you infuse that element of it into, you know, a, a Passover sermon? I mean, really, I, I, we, well, there's a lot of group songs, uh, mm-hmm. there's, there's, there's meditations, there's reflections, and really, you know, we look at the themes of Passover, the themes of freedom, which is just as important today as it was in, mm. in the uh, really days of uh, anti- antiquity, and we really try and make the, the Seder come alive mm-hmm. uh, through, using, uh, through using media, through using um, uh, entertainment, and through having this collective and shared experience. Wow. The neighborhood where your congregation comes from mostly has pretty rapidly changed due to gentrification. Are you seeing a difference in the makeup of your congregation, or is it pretty much the same? So Jimmy Kimmel likes to talk about hipster or Hasid. <laughs> uh, I really, uh, I think I'm, I'm living at the intersection. <laughs> so uh, it, it has changed. Uh, it's changing uh, by the second, mm-hmm. but you know Pratt is a, a strong, established Brooklyn, Brooklyn institution, mm-hmm. and it's growing, and uh, it's incredible to have students from all over the world. Mm-hmm. And also, on a personal note, uh, I'm part of the Chabad Lubavitch movement, and I know we have a network of 5,000 couples in over 100 countries, mm-hmm. and it's, it really gives me a lot of inspiration to know there are going to be seders all over the world from uh, Beijing to Bali, right. and uh, knowing that, uh, you know, my, my holy brothers and sisters, my rabbis and rabbitsons will be inspiring uh, Jews all over the world on this very uh, holy and important day. Wow. What about the Passover celebration do people outside the faith need to know? Well, really, the ancient world, I think, valued powerful people and powerful personalities. Um, For example, Alexander the Great or the Great Pharaohs. And the story of Passover, I think, uh, depicts that a small uh, tribe of people, the everyday, the downbeat, the downtrodden, can stand up, can change the world, and really can can, uh, have an indelible impact and can be the architects of the future, not prisoners of the past. The Haggadah, which I brought with me, I have a gift for you. Uh, The Haggadah, the Passover uh, story, talks about four children. A yes. wise child, a wicked child, or as I prefer to say, a cynical child, mm-hmm. a, a simple child, and a child that doesn't even know how to ask. Mm-hmm. However, that uh, my, my, uh, my, my Rebbe, my, my teacher, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, spoke about a fifth child, which is mm-hmm. the child who's not even at the Seder. Wow. So it's something to really inspire people to, I, I like to talk about a sixth child, a child that returns back to the Seder. Mm-hmm. So you should know that, that, that uh, a Seder is something, it's really for everybody, everyone is welcome, mm-hmm. which is why, you know, uh, my door is uh, wide open. We have perhaps the most diverse Seder in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. I think uh, every demographic is represented, and I think it's something that is beautiful uh, and celebrated. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Appreciate it. And thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend and happy Easter and Passover. We'll be back next week to talk about the NYPD Muslim surveillance lawsuit, bail reform, Brooklyn's shrinking population numbers, and local politics. Hope you can join us. Mm